Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome back to the Lockdown Lit Fest, if you've been kind enough to join us before. And if this is your first visit, a very warm welcome to you. And we hope you enjoy all that we're working so hard pro bono to offer, a live online literature festival that's worthy of the name. Uh, we hope that you're well. We hope that you're keeping safe. And we hope that you're locked down with people you love and who love you. We have a bit of a treat today. We're marking something of an anniversary. Uh, because back in August 1961, a thing happened. It was called the construction of the Berlin Wall, although, of course, before it was a wall, it was the Berlin Fence of barbed wire. To mark the anniversary, last year was published this fantastic book called Checkpoint Charlie, The Cold War, The Berlin Wall, and The Most Dangerous Place on Earth, written by Ian McGregor. Ian is an editor and publisher of nonfiction for Headline and has over 25 years' experience of working with authors such as Ranulph Fiennes, Mervyn Bragg, Simon Sharma, and Max Hastings, to name but a very few. What you may also like to know is he's also the author of a fantastic cycling book called To Hell on a Bike Riding the Paris Roubaix, the toughest cycle race on, uh, no, the toughest race in cycling is what I should say. Ian, I'll stop blathering. A very warm well, welcome to the Lockdown Lit Fest studio. How are you? Where are you locked down? Are you well? I am well. I'm in southeast London uh, with the family. I have two young teenagers. So, my life's busy with either working on the day to day with headline or trying to uh, struggle through their online lessons with their school. So that which doesn't stop. But obviously, we're coming up to the summer holidays soon. So that, that's a, that's a good thing, too. That's a good thing. It's tough. It's tough for so many people in so many ways, mm -hmm. all of us in individual ways. I don't want to reprise the roots of the Cold War. Um, and because we are in the midst of lockdown still, although its grip is slightly being released, it strikes me there's a fantastic analogy to be made with what's happening both in here in the UK, where we're, we are broadcasting from, but also pretty much every country around the world who's in lockdown. And the city of Berlin that was locked down in its own very special sense. Um, I'm not going to say that you were prescient because you could, none of us could have seen COVID coming. But um, while, before we launch off into the book, what sort of parallels do you draw between um, Berlin in the late 50s and 60s and where we are now? Uh, well, I was going to say, I mean, that the main thing is, uh, you're right. I, I had a wry smile on my face and I thought we're all going into lockdown uh, around the country, around the world. And obviously in London, in my part of London, uh, I suppose the main thing to think about is, uh, despite what's going on in America right now, is uh, you haven't got a, a paramilitary police force, border guard system, uh, highly tuned network of uh, state security monitoring your every move and obviously shooting to kill if you fancy breaking your lockdown and breaking out to the, to the west from obviously East Germany, West Germany, but more importantly, East Berlin into the West Berlin sectors to try and find some freedom, which obviously prior to the Berlin Wall, which we'll go into more detail, that's what was happening prior to the barrier and the Berlin Wall being built. Let's talk us for a second or two, or for as long as you like, actually, uh, about the installation of the Berlin Wall at sort of 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the evening um, in August 1961, which was just, I mean, the most extraordinary event in geopolitics. Yes, it, it caught everyone by surprise. It's one of those key moments, whether it be, for instance, Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 41. It caught the uh, the allies, uh, both in the city itself, in the Western sectors, uh, in Western Europe, where NATO was by then, as, as well as around the world in America, in London, in Paris, uh, and obviously the, uh, German civilians in East and West. It, it, it caught everyone by surprise. I mean, the authorities in East Germany were very uh, careful and deliberate in how they planned it. They were going to do it over a weekend, on a hot August weekend, when most Berliners were taking advantage of the good weather and the fact that it was a quiet Sunday. They would go out to uh, the various lakes and woods and forests that surround the city. It's, it's beautiful, there still is. And uh, that's where they were or planning to go uh, with their families to their, their second homes or, or allotments to do some gardening. So the city, as, as every major city normally is, of a weekend on a Sunday, is, is, is quite quiet. There's not many people around. And that's when they decided to, uh, to implement what was called Operation Rose, uh, where the eastern side of the city would be flooded with construction workers, security troops and police. 
as well as various armoured vehicles, trucks, water cannons, to make sure that what they had planned to do was, was implemented quickly and without interruption from both sides, the Allies watching and the East German civilians that were rubbing their eyes thinking, what the hell's going on in my city? What's astounded me from reading your book, which is so beautifully researched, is that obviously it was led by Eric Holliker, who was then uh, the leader of, uh, uh, of East Germany, we'll call it for now. Uh, then, and he only gave them two weeks to plan for this massive sort of civil engineering construction project, let alone the politics behind it. Yes, well, I mean, it had been ongoing. I mean, I think the uh, from the research I'd done and the people I talked to, especially on the eastern side, I, I, I interviewed almost 80 people yeah. from, all, from all aspects of Berlin life. So I, I got a very clear understanding of, of what their life was like. But looking at the archives as well, the, the East Germans have, had some kind of plan to, to build barriers for a couple of years. It, it, it was just the, the, uh, the intergovernmental arguments and debates that were going on at much higher levels between East Berlin and Moscow, between Ulbricht, who was the leader at the time, and obviously Honecker worked for him until he eventually took over but between Ulbricht and Nikita Khrushchev. Yeah. And Ulbricht was constantly pressing Khrushchev over that time that something has to be done to stop this flood, this immigration flood of my own people uh, going to the West uh, to, to obviously have a new life, to escape the system that I'm trying to, I'm very proud of, but I'm trying to uh, build here this socialist paradise in East Germany. And obviously by the time the war was built in August 61, out of a population of just over 17 million, 2.1 million had, had fled to the West. And of that 2.1 million, 50% of them were under 25 years of age, which as everyone knows, that's the professional classes, that's, that's the lifeblood of any economy. So if you've got this happening on such a rate, they were talking about it. So yes, they implemented it within two weeks, but that was the, the, uh, the instructions of which units they were gonna use, what materials yeah. they were gonna use uh, to build the initial barriers how big the barriers were going to be. They're going to circle the whole city. So not just split the sectors within the heart of the city, but surround all the Western sectors in, in the East German hinterland, which is over 150 kilometers. So it's a huge job, involves thousands and thousands of people, uh, takes a lot of planning. So yes, within two weeks it, it was done, but they had been, uh, it was in the back of their mind. It was on someone's drawing board for months before then. Let's give it for those that are unfamiliar. Um, and I'm realizing ever increasingly that I'm getting older and older, although I wasn't even born when the Berlin Wall went up. So, Berlin at the time, post Second World War, was divided into four sectors. And on the eastern part was the East German sector, also supported by the Russians. And in the western half, it starts at the top, it's divided in three horizontal layers top one, France, middle one, England, bottom one, uh, the United States of America. Is that, have I got that right? Yes, well, basically, it was it was the Soviet sector. It wasn't the East German sector at the Soviet time. Sector. It was the Soviet sector. So it was the four powers that had won the Second World War. So as uh, Germany itself was split into four sectors, and interestingly, which you you find out a lot from uh, when you interview a lot of uh, British Royal Military Police who are obviously in charge of the Berlin sector in, uh, for Britain, they will tell you there are, there are pains to tell you that. The, the French were given uh, their northern sector uh, of control from the British sector is actually the British sector, as it was with uh, the West, West Germany itself. It was, it was basically de Gaulle was very keen that France should have its, uh, its own key sector to govern in Germany itself and in the city of Berlin. So, they, yes, they, they were the four sectors. And obviously, uh, the allied sectors altogether, France, Britain and, and America, like, like you've said, represented about two-thirds of the city, and then obviously the Soviet sector had the rump on the eastern side. So, an 11-foot-high barrier it ended up being, starting with barbed wire, 79 miles of fencing, 300 watchtowers, 250 dog runs, 20 bunkers, operated around by the clock by guards who were trained to shoot to kill. Mm -hmm. That's the wall. With the construction, I mean, the stories that you tell in the, in, in the book, Checkpoint Charlie, of the workers who were there to put it up, each of them had an armed guard right behind them to prevent them trying to defect, trying mm. to es escape. So that's the wall in, in, in essence. Can you bring us to how it came to be that the, the, the sort of corner of Friedrichstrasse, Zimmerstrasse, and the beautifully aptly named Maustrasse hmm. came so poignant 
so pertinent and so evocative? Well, it was basically uh, Checkpoint Charlie was the international crossing point. So even before the war went up, there was that was where you generally had uh, where diplomats and inter- international uh, military personnel, civic personnel would normally cross. The city itself was very porous before August 61, uh, which I, well, seminars I give to students, I have a presentation and I show them photographs before and after the, the first barriers were uh, erected. And you can see how easy it was for the immigration of East German refugees to escape into the West Berlin sectors because you've got, I mean, the whole sector, the city split down the middle, crisscrossed 93 streets, I mean, which is huge. I mean, you could put an army through there if you needed to. So uh, it was very easy, but the Checkpoint Charlie was the, the seen as the key place because basically Checkpoint Charlie is so close to where the international and governmental areas were. So the East German government is literally a stone's throw away just off of Unter den Linden, which is probably, let me think, it's probably about five, 600 metres away from Checkpoint Charlie once you're in the Soviet sector. And then it spreads out all the, all the, the old, the Reichschancellery, which is obviously the Reichstag, that, that was there, that was in uh, the, just inside the British sector. Uh, so that was purposely chosen as the place where military and civil and political cross, crossing points would be everywhere else along the sector. People were just crisscrossing as they do in every, every walk of life uh, in any other city, as we do in London today. It's you've got to get you've got to cross the city to go to work. You might have cross the city to go to hospital for an appointment, see a loved one, see a girlfriend, watch a football match, anything. Those that that trans transport of, of humanity happened every day. So you can hide yourself within that to to. Uh, to escape if that's what you wanted to do, if you're an East German and that's what you wanted to do, as long as you didn't make it too obvious and you weren't carrying much. And that's why it was so successful. And that's why hundreds of thousands of East Germans managed to do that. Because by the time of 61, the intra-German border, so the, the border, the physical border that separates East from West Germany was so watertight, uh, barbed wire, electric fences, minefields in places, machine guns, uh, armored cars, that kind of thing in places. It was a proper iron curtain, as, as Churchill yeah. famously described years before already. So the one loophole was the Western sectors and the, the crossing points, and that, that's why it was. But Checkpoint Charlie played its part, but it was it was one part in a wider uh, crossing area that, that was yeah. easy to navigate before the war went up. I was intrigued to read in, in, in the book um, about the iconic wooden shed on the western side. But before we come to that, just for those that don't know, can you explain why this particular checkpoint was called Checkpoint Charlie? It, it, was, just, it, it was just in the alphabet. So uh, Checkpoint Alpha was from the, the, the crossing point from that designated you're leaving West Germany going into East Germany. Because remember, uh, Berlin itself was over 75, 80 miles inside uh, the Soviet sector, which became East Germany, so it's it's an island of Allied occupation within, well in within the, the Eastern Zone behind the Iron Curtain. So, from uh, if you're on a train or you're in a car and you're allowed the official access, which was agreed by Stalin before he passed away, uh, from after the Berlin airlift in '48, uh, you would cross at Helmstadt, uh, which was designated Checkpoint Alpha. You would drive down the autobahn or be on the train and you would arrive in the western sectors of uh, Berlin. But before then, you would you would have to cross through Checkpoint Bravo. Uh, so the logical next crossing point, which takes you from Allied territory into communist territory, was designated Checkpoint Charlie. And that's why it was given the name. It was purely that. It was, it was just on the alphabet. Uh, it was only obviously later as events uh, uh, occurred around it over the, the years of the Cold War and the Berlin Wall being up, that Checkpoint Charlie, the name, yeah. garnered such a reputation. It's a fantastic piece of alliteration with a very prosaic origin. I was delighted to find that out. Um, so over the next, over the 28 years after the building of the wall, you say over 5,000 people attempted to smash through it, swim across it, tunnel under it, even fly over it. Can you just, before we come to some of the interviews that you've done and the new information that you found, explain the importance of the 24-year-old chap called Gunter Litvin and what he represents? 
Well, it's quite a sad story. And it, it's funny you should mention it because it, I, I did a, a talk with a, a school earlier this week and I have him in the presentation. Yeah. So I, I because it, it is tell, my whole point of the book was I wanted to tell the human story of, of living in Berlin, serving in Berlin and escaping through the Berlin Wall or or suffering imprisonment because you've tried. So there's lots of books out there that tell you the facts. I, I want to talk about the human stories and interview all these people. So with Gunter Littkin, what, what I try and express to people is he was the very first person, very first East German that was actually shot and killed, died of his wounds from trying to escape through the wall. And his story is, again, it's, he was a bit of a Dell boy. He was an East German Dell boy, really. He, he was a, a, a tailor, a dressmaker uh, that was from East Berlin. Uh, but obviously with the, uh, with the allied sectors and, the, and the, 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 the Soviet sector, they had by then they had their own currencies and the differentiation with what you would earn in, the, in West Berlin, that if you took it back to East Berlin, it, it, it was a three to one difference. So you could buy a heck of a lot more with West Berlin currency in East Berlin. So Gunther was one of the lucky ones who had a thriving business in West Berlin, he would live in East Berlin and he would crisscross constantly daily doing his job, but obviously gave him spending power. So he, he lived a very nice life in East Berlin, but wrong place at the wrong time. He, he was actually in the process of moving lock, stock and barrel to West Berlin uh, a couple of weeks before the Berlin Wall was erected in 61. And he was moving with his brother and his brother was still over in West Berlin in the new flat that they bought. Gunther had just decided to go back to East Berlin that time to get some final things, and that's when the barrier went up, so obviously to his consternation. So he spent the first couple of weeks of the wall's life going up and down like thousands of other East Berliners, seeing if there's any loopholes he could find to try and escape. Couldn't find one, unfortunately, so the only thing he could find was, much like London, uh, Berlin has a major river running through it, which is the River Spray. And from the River Spray, there's lots, like it is in London, there's lots of canals and, and smaller rivers that run off it. And he managed to find one that would only involve swimming about 200 metres across the canal to get to the western side. Uh, because as you said at the beginning, at the, the first iteration of the Berlin Wall is basically barbed wire fence. Uh, so if you're determined to get through, you will get through it. Uh, and he's, he did swim the canal, uh, even though it's quite cold, it's August, but it's still cold. Uh, and unfortunately, he was given a warning. Uh, at that time, he wasn't aware that they were going to shoot to kill. No one was. Uh, and they fired uh, three or four shots, three of which hit him fatally. Uh, and, and he bled to death. He died. Uh, caused a huge stink, obviously. Uh, the authorities tried to sweep it under the carpet and say he'd actually been shot by the fascists themselves on the western side. Uh, but he was used as a signal, I suppose, to the rest of the population that the, the GDR was serious about uh, implementing its rules of if you try and escape through this barrier, you're going to risk your life doing it. It's a hell of a sad story. Mm -hmm. Before we come to some of the interviews, just uh, to come back to something I mentioned earlier on, this fantastic iconic wooden shed that anybody who hears the phrase Checkpoint Charlie has in their images, whether from films you know, with Tom Hanks or Michael Caine or whoever, or those of us who, who, went, who went there and saw it. Why did we have a wooden shed on, on the Western side? And why was it very different on the, uh, in the Russian sector on the East German side? Uh, purely propaganda. And that's not just me saying that. That's from the guys who served there. I mean, it was uh, the Allies uh, definitely for the first uh, eight, nine, ten years of uh, the Berlin, Berlin Wall's life, still refused to recognize uh, East Germany, the GDR, as a sovereign state. That would happen in the early 70s, once uh, tensions had, had slightly calmed down. Uh, but right up until that point, they, they never recognized that East Germany ran the Soviet sector. It, would, it all harked back to the Four Powers Agreement after the Second World War when the city itself and the country itself had been split apart. They, they obviously recognized uh, the Soviet occupiers of, of East Berlin, but they didn't recognize the East Germans who were there. So while the East Germans had built the wall, uh, and then they obviously set about constructing a bigger wall, a more complex wall, more complex barriers, the actual checkpoint Charlie itself and the other crossing points that were there developed into these, these huge complex constructions that would allow people eventually to, to pass through, but under severe checks 
uh, and these these buildings and and and, and uh, vehicle crossways and that kind of thing cost millions and millions of pounds over the years to to uh, to build and maintain and the staffing levels and everything else. And it was obviously a show of strength and a show of what well, you are now in you are now entering East German sovereign territory. But so the Allies never saw it that way, and that's why they resolved to think, you know what, we're just going to stick with the basic hut we've always had. And obviously, uh, the, the Tom Hanks film you mentioned, Bridge of Spies, that has they they obviously made sure they had the uh, the original hut at the time, which is a very basic hut, holds a few people, very small, it's like a garden shed almost. Uh, and that was almost to cock a, a, your nose at, at these Germans a couple of hundred yards further along to the east who were building this massive construction saying, well, you know, this goes to show that we're, we're, we're not intimidated by what you're constructing over there. Uh, this is all we need because that's we, we don't recognize your country. Obviously, further down the line, they, they did develop and have a, a larger checkpoint, Charlie, which was really like a 1980s mobile teaching office. Uh, which would then incorporate uh, more allied staff primarily to accommodate more people passing through the checkpoint. Because obviously, like I said, as soon as the GDR was recognised as a sovereign state in the 80s, by the time of 1989, when the checkpoints would be opened, there was a lot more people, uh, a lot more human traffic passing through, a lot more tourism passing through would go through Checkpoint Charlie. So the Allies did need a a little bit uh, a more larger admin uh, facility to uh, to to make sure that happened smoothly, but it, it was never anything big. And when you go to see it today in the Allied War Museum in Berlin, you, you look at it and think, "My God, was that it? It's tiny. <laughs> my garden shed in my garden's bigger than that." <laughs> of course, we called it Checkpoint. We, we're referring to it as Checkpoint Charlie, but of course, from the other side of the wall, it was called um, Grenzübergangstelle. Is that right? If I remember that. Yes, right. that's right. Yeah, and. Uh, they're, Border they're, crossing point. They had a few swear words thrown in, and some of the stories are hilarious. I mean, some of the uh, some of the British journalists I interviewed, who obviously would use Checkpoint Charlie to go back and forwards for their work, because a lot of them uh, lived in East Berlin uh, to cover the stories that the East German government would. They'd, they'd have to go to the press conferences that the East German government would give and talk about, you know, economic uh, successes, uh, government quotas, that kind of thing. But they lived in East Berlin, but would obviously file their reports in West Berlin. So they would have to cross Checkpoint Charlie all the time. And I, I talk about it in the book, the, uh, the pride and the impatience, the East German officers would snap at them when they was these these uh, Western reporters would say, well, I'm going back to uh, West Berlin, and I might go back to the capital of West Germany, Bonn, and they were and they would it was almost like silence. It's, it's like Hauptstadt. Hauptstadt was the, the word they would bark at everybody because they they considered East Berlin the capital of not only East Germany but still of Germany itself, and it, it was it was mind games more than anything else. How did you go about finding people to interview? Because you interview such a range of people in this book, the men that built it, dismantled it, children that crossed it, relatives and friends who lost loved ones, loved ones trying to escape over it. And then, of course, all the military policemen and soldiers who guarded the checkpoint. But what I really like is you've actually got hold of people from CIA, MI6 and Stasi operatives who looked at who were responsible for operations across its borders. I mean, it's a it's a hell of a job to have done. And I'm I don't want you to give away trade secrets, but could you lift the veil a little bit on how a research, how research for this worked and how you strategized it? Strategizing was the first thing. So, I mean, I, I, I am fortunate because, I mean, you said at the beginning, I, I, I publish history books. So I, I work with a lot of authors. I work with them closely on how they're constructing their, their narratives and doing their research. So I, I was fortunate to pick up hints and tips from them about how they go about their business as well. But first and foremost, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student of the Cold War anyway. I've studied it. My degree is in modern European history. Uh, my dissertation was on the Prague Spring. I was lucky enough to study, uh, do a student exchange to Russia. I've camped with these Germans. You know, I've, I've done all that, and, it, and it, I developed a love of it. I've read countless, countless books before I even thought about writing this book. So I, I, I knew a lot about it. But... Uh, my first point was to say I'm following the chronology of the whole of the Berlin Wall, so that's 28 years. I want to obviously talk about, within, this, within the space of a book, I can't talk about everything, but I obviously need to talk about the, the hot points of the history of the wall. And if I do that, 
then I have to go back to the archive sources. So I started studying those. Those archive sources give you some names that, that well, obviously the filed reports or the media covered it or something like that. And then you then it's just detective work and you try and contact them if they're still alive. And then as as with anything of, of uh, with any book that I've worked on with an author, they've told me this happens and it happened to me is is if you're interviewing a veteran. So, for instance, say, for instance, I'm interviewing uh, might interview one of the key sergeants that was in charge of the British sector at Checkpoint Charlie the night the, the, the wall opened, a guy called Sergeant Chris Toft. So I was interviewing him because I, I, I found him, I researched him, I found him online. Uh, I interviewed him, and as he's telling me an anecdote, he would say, oh, but, you know, this is a great story, but you need to talk to S, X, Y, and Z, and here's their contact details, and that would lead me to that person. And so that process happened for the Royal Military Police, but it would also happen for the US military police, the French gendarmerie. If I talk to Bricksmiths, who are the uh, the British intelligence liaison uh, unit, who would go in and out of uh, East Germany, East German hinterland outside of Berlin, to uh, to re- do reconnaissance and surveillance on what the East Germans and the Russians were up to. And this was an international agreement, which I talk about in the book, and the Russians did the same with us going into the Western sectors. Again, people would say, oh, you need to talk to X, you need to talk to Y. And it just builds up, and it, it obviously it took it took a long time. I mean, I, it took me two years of research and interviews to do all of this, and and that same process happened with uh, the East German side. So East German border guards, East German police, East German politicians, some Stasi uh, operatives. It was the same process. It it's just whoever you're talking to has different levels of. Uh, security about what they want to talk about how you will interview them how you will show them their taped recordings how that has then been transcribed what level of uh, redactions they're allowed yeah it's just a lot of processing Ian, I'm delighted to hear you use the acronym um, Bricksmiths and its counterpart, of course, which, if memory serves, was Socksmiths, hmm. because it gives the lie to the, the public perception that it was a, an impermeable membrane, to put it that way, halfway down across this city. It was, in fact, a semi-permeable membrane. As you say, people used to go to and fro across Checkpoint Child. There was tourism, so But there, was intelli- there were intelligence sources going backwards and forwards, and, of course, military sources going backwards and forwards. Can you explain what the role of um, Bricksmiths and Socksmiths was and sure. what that allowed? Because, it, it, to my mind, it gave, it gave us great back-channel communication opportunities. Yes. Well, it, it's... Uh... I mean, it, it was it was a very very uh, uh, sensible thing for the Allies to do when when the four powers were still on speaking terms, civil speaking terms, and uh, realizing that uh, the Russians were kind of there to stay in East Germany. Stalin wasn't going to get his wish mm. of a, a neutralized, disarmed whole Germany, and if he couldn't have that, the best next thing was obviously to keep his chunk of East Germany. That would then be a buffer zone to the rest of the Eastern Europe that he now had. You know, he was never going to have another surprise attack like the Nazis. But that, that's by the by. But so the this sensible instruction was given that from 1947-48, the, the Allies sat down and realized that they both sides needed to be more confident than what they were at the time, that each of them were playing within limits by the rules. And by that, what I mean is there would be no surprises in terms of troop deployments, hardware deployments, what kind of hardware they were using, what kind of tactics they were using. And so all sides developed uh, these reconnaissance surveillance units that would be allowed to go into each other's areas of occupation to do official tours along designated routes at agreed times uh, to see what the other was doing. Now, obviously, this was... People would cheat. The Russians cheated. We cheated. There's, there's only so much you'll allow your adversary to look at and take notes on because you don't want to obviously give, give the game away completely. And uh, that's, that's where the fun and games begin. And that's where the, uh, the, the adventures that these guys got, up, got uh, into, on the Allied side anyway, because predominantly I interviewed the Allies from the French, uh, American and British units uh 
where it was cat and mouse. And it was very much like, you know, the, the term wacky races came up a lot when I talked to these guys <laughs> because uh, it sounds on paper, it sounds like, well, it, it can't be that much, uh, excuse me, it can't be that difficult to do this to find out what the, uh, the ad, your adversary is up to. But it is if they're trying to ram you off the road, if they're trying to get one upmanship on you and, and stop you looking in areas they don't want you to look at. So that was the job of our guys was to, yes, they would follow designated routes and look at agreed sites that the, the Russians and the East Germans would allow them to. But they would definitely, definitely want to go off road and look at other things that their satellite imagery might have picked up and think, well, hang on, what tanker? I, we haven't seen that tank before. We need to dispatch a unit to see where this tank's deployed and what, what its makeup is. And if possible, get one of our guys to take photographs of this tank. Might it be a tank, might be a mobile missile launching site, might be latest uh, armoured car they're using. Uh, to get that, you really had to take your life in your hands. And for that, they were equipped with state of the art, semi indestructible vehicles that, you know, reinforced uh, cages, all that kind of thing. Because like I said, it, it was cat and mouse, but they were playing for high stakes. I mean, the, the, there were a few Allied servicemen that were killed uh, doing this job. There were, there were several that were severely injured. I interviewed one guy, uh, Major Peter Williams. Oh, he's General Peter Williams now, but he was a major oh, yes. at the time in the 1980s. That was the, the Stasi tried to assassinate him. And as he was showing his new commanding officer around the the... The, the, the routes that Bricksmiths were allowed to go through in East Germany, in the hinterland around uh, East Berlin. And the, the, uh, the method of uh, taking you out, so to speak, by the Stasi was to have a road accident with an eight-ton truck that they would ram you off the road when you were least expecting. And that's what happened to him. And they were saved by the fact that their upturned vehicle that was being crushed by this truck happened to be wedged by a tree that stopped them rolling off into the side of the road and, and that would have finished them off. Uh, and interestingly, while, while we're talking about this, a, a, a point that I make in the book is Peter looked at his Stasi file, which was something like 28 volumes. Uh, once the wall had fallen down, the Stasi archives were opened. He managed to find, which is very like him, he managed to find the two Stasi operatives that had uh, undertaken this hit, the hit job, and he met them for a cup of coffee and he had a very much uh, no hard feelings, uh, you know, all's well, that ends well. Just had a nice chat with them and, and they were very open about it, too, and said, you know, well, uh, we got a, a week's two weeks holiday, I think it was, uh, for doing the job. But if we killed you, we would have got a month's extra pay as well. And, uh, and they were very phlegmatic about it. And that, that's the kind of uh, so it's almost like a camaraderie. Yeah. Uh, it's like like the, the the fighter pilots in World War One, because as Peter said, and many other Allied uh, liaison missions—that's what they were called, the liaison missions—said to me there was a, a there was a reciprocal about they came to their barracks for drinks and parties, and the and the British, Americans, and French would go over to the Russians, and they would have parties and they would do celebrations of specific events, like obviously the the Russian victory in the Second World War and May Day. There would, there would be a big party for that. And they showed me lots of photos of them all wearing their, their different hats. Uh, so, yeah, there was, a, there was a play for high stakes, though. And I, I wanted to capture that in the book to say it wasn't just about the Berlin Wall and those checkpoints. There was, there was bigger games going on around the city as well. Absolutely. Lest we forget, of course, the West didn't, although there had been some signaling, nobody knew that the wall was going to go up when the wall went up. And of course, for those on the front line in the Allied sector, they were worried that this was the start of the invasion. There was a lot of nervousness. So the whole existence of Brexmiths and Soxmiths was sort of, sort of to create that yeah, sort well, of a, level yeah. of, a level of accord. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and in some ways you could say, and I'm sure, I'm sure they would say to a degree, maybe they dropped the ball in yeah. not realising what the East Germans were, gonna, were up to. Uh, because moving that amount of materiel yeah. Uh, tons and tons and tons of, of, of uh, building blocks, concrete, sand, uh, cement pillars, barbed wire. I mean, they practically emptied East Germany and yeah. Poland and Czechoslovakia of barbed wire just to build this thing. It was a huge project. And then, uh, yeah, and then the thousands upon thousands of construction workers, the militia, the armed militia and uh, regular East German troops that would be guarding them to make sure that it was uh, going to be built without any interruption. 
all that must have been noticed. And again, when I talked to guys from the period, there were reports coming through in dribs and drabs, a trickle from various directions yeah. saying, well, this is going on. You'd have civilians who have escaped East Germany that were coming through the refugee centres in West Berlin that in their debrief would be saying, oh, by the way, we've just seen tons and tons of, of, of uh, building blocks and, and material like they're, they're constructing something. We don't know what they're doing, but there's this and troop movements. So that all was going on. So I, I, I would imagine it will come out in years to pass. There will be communiques that are still under lock and key that we don't know about. Right. But it definitely took the the, the 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 upper echelons of the command and political structures in the West by surprise. Right. We don't have a huge amount of time. There's a couple more things I want to ask you, if I may, please, Ian. Whenever you're researching a book like this, I know to my own cost, occasionally you set your sights. You think, if I can just get this one interview, that will be the sort of central pillar. I know this isn't quite, the, this isn't that sort of book. And it's entirely possible my question is, 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 mis, is misframed. But was the one, inter because you have such a fantastic range of voices across the course of this narrative, but was the one interview when you came out of, or when you, the phone, you put the phone down and you sort of punched the air and thought, that's it, that's, that synopsizes the story for me. Yes, uh, Adolf Nachstedt, he gets his, he gets a, I mean, he's sprinkled throughout the book, but he gets a dedicated yep. chapter to himself. Uh, I was introduced to him uh, at a, a, a US military veterans uh, reunion in Berlin. It was, it was for the 75th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift. Everyone was there, there was about 300 of them there. And I just so happened to be sitting next to him. No one has said, oh, sit next to Adolf. He's got great stories. Mm -hmm. I just happened to be sitting next to him and his wife. And he just had an incredible story. I mean, it, and it sums up the whole, not just the Berlin Wall, it sums up the Cold War. Cold War, it's right. The whole duration. I mean, Volksdeutscher, uh, he belonged to a Volksdeutscher family. He was born in the Bronx, but his father wanted to go back to uh, Nazi Germany to, to uh, support the fatherland, uh, smuggled the family back, uh, they survived, uh, obviously, the terrors of, of uh, Allied bombing in Berlin and around Berlin. They survived Soviet occupation. He witnessed uh, the, the Allied Berlin airlift. His father was working in the Allied uh, airports, Tempelhof, unloading the aircraft. He was chased by the KGB because he was stealing coal for his family and food supplies uh, to the point where he was lucky he had an American passport. He had to go back home in the 50s. And he enlisted in the American army, but obviously as soon as they heard his back, saw his background, they thought you're going to be in military intelligence. And so from the 1954, 55, right the way through to the couple of years after the Berlin Wall, he was a spook spy in, in Berlin. So to capture his story was incredible. He witnessed everything. He witnessed uh, key East German personnel coming through uh, before the barrier went up and he'd have to debrief them bodyguard them he witnessed the wall going up obviously he was on the other side he was living in safe houses spying figuring out and reporting about what 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 did this mean this wall going up did they mean war he was one of the key voices uh he witnessed uh, the arrival of jfk uh giving his famous speech in berlin uh, Berliner. i am a doer. yeah and, and, and one of the key stories as well is he uh the famous photo that we've all seen famous photo that we've all seen of uh the East German border guard who, who leaps over the, the barbed wire in the early days of the, the wall being built, uh, uh, Comrade Schumann. And that's on every poster, T-shirt, mug you could think of. You go to Berlin, you'll see it everywhere. And Adolf was given the job of bodyguarding him because they were worried that the Stasi who infiltrated the city at will were, were either going to assassinate or kidnap him because it was such a big uh, propaganda coup for the West to think, OK, you're building a wall but your own troops on the border are jumping over the barbed wire because they don't, they don't agree with it. And, and that was a key story no one had told before. Uh, and that was one of the key ones. So I interviewed him at length uh, three times, got about three, four hours of uh, interviews. Uh, and it was just, and from a journalist's writer's perspective, you're thinking, this is gold. This is absolute gold. No one's interviewed him ever. It is gold source material. You write it up well. One last question. I'm afraid we are very pushed for time in. I do apologise. No you mentioned the shed, the iconic wooden shed, and it's now in the museum. When you go there, knowing what you now know, and when you're, if you're allowed to put your hand on it, what goes through your mind, knowing now so much of what that represented to people on both sides of the wall? Uh, the hairs on the back of your neck go up. Uh, I was lucky enough that the, uh, the director of the museum, a guy called Bernd Costa, 
Uh, he's left now, but he was at the time. He was so kind and helpful to me. Uh, he's an Anglophile. So he gave me lots of what he allowed me to go into the checkpoints. So it's wow. there. You're not allowed to even go touch it. And he let me stand in it. I, it was just amazing. Absolutely amazing. And that's the, uh, the interestingly, the original wooden hut is now back in America. That got yes. transported. They actually had three of them. And the second one that they used from the late 50s onwards is in the museum. And that has bullet holes in it. Uh, because every now and again, the East Germans or a Soviet would would have a pot shot at them, and, it, and it's embedded in in the, the the wooden support structures of the of the of checkpoint Charlie. So to do that is just if you're a lover of history, if you're a student of history, anything, it, it, it's just it's amazing. It would be like sitting in Nelson's chair on HMS Victory. It'd be the well, same kind of thing. It'd touching be, on his Shackleton's dinghy. Exactly. It's it's you you appreciate the sacrifice and the service and the uh, the memories that are all loaded into this insignificant uh, physical piece of, of wood. If, uh, wood. if wood could talk, but happily exactly. it doesn't because you've done the talking for it. Uh, Ian, I do apologize. We have to end there. Before we do that, can you just name check the museum again? Because people will be watching this hopefully from around the world and we'd love to point them to it. So they can it's, go and see. Sure, it's the it's the, it's called the Cold War Museum. But it's called it's the official name is the Allied Cold War Museum, and it's on Clay Alley, uh, in in the American sector in West Berlin. Thank you for that, Ian, very much. And Ian, thank you so much for coming to join us. Congratulations on Checkpoint Charlie, the Cold War, the Berlin Wall, and the most dangerous place on earth. I hope you've enjoyed this chat. I've got a couple of things to say about this book. If you liked Anna Fonda's Stasi Land this is the book for you. And who didn't like Anna Funder's Stasiland? It's a hell of a story. It's beautifully told. And what he, Ian, very carefully does is through these fantastic interviews with key eyewitnesses, he retells the human story behind those fateful words, Iron Curtain. It's a hell of a piece. It's published uh, by Headline. Uh, and it's, uh, sorry, no, isn't it? It's published by Little Brown. I do apologize. I've got that completely wrong. Ian, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. We hope you've enjoyed this event. And as ever, we hope you're safe. We hope you keep well. And we hope that you take care. Thank you for joining us. Cheerio.